Good afternoon. Dr. Maxine Olson, the UN coordinator in India, and she's ahead of the UN family in India, and I'm really delighted to have her with us in this session this afternoon. It's also because uh, Dr. Maxine Olson is leaving India after having led the UN family in India for the last five years very admirably. Uh, she is going back to headquarters in New York very soon, and uh, this is also an opportunity for, for us to pay a tribute to the kind of contributions which she has made in the humanitarian sector in India, because as I will be just mentioning in my uh, brief presentation, uh, one of the most important things which has happened with the UN system in India has been the fact that uh, the United Nations in India has uh, launched a program called the Disaster Risk Management Program, which is one of the largest programs in social mobilization ever in any part of the world because it is currently operating in 169 districts in 17 states and it has been expanded now to 241 districts in 21 states of this country. And it is working with villagers, working with district administrations, working with local communities. And she has conceptualized this program with the Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, and with the state governments. This is one of the largest social mobilization programs in the country. And so it's a, it's a great honor for us to have her here with us as a a very distinguished uh, guest of honor in this session. She will also be delivering the valedictory address t today. Uh, she'll be leaving briefly in between because uh, today is the United Nations Day and, and there is a program happening at the United Nations so, so she will just briefly go away at four o'clock to join the rest of the UN family and she will be back with us at, uh, uh, immediately after you know, she launches the events at the UN House. Now, uh, when I thought about this, when I see a very distinguished audience like this with uh, such very rich insights in this field of disaster management, when I look around the room, I see many of you who have actually had uh, accomplished yourself and participated and contributed yourself in, uh, in this whole transition, which we call a paradigm shift in disaster management in India. And I'm very happy to be a part of this paradigm shift because I work in the National Disaster Management Authority as one of the members and this authority is headed by the Honorable Prime Minister of India. And uh, Vice Chairman of the authority is General N.C. Vij, the former Army Chief, whom many of our Army senior officers who come from the Armed Forces would know. And uh, General Vij uh, is a Vice Chairman with the status of a Union uh, Cabinet Minister. And there are eight of us as members from different walks of life. And I came into the National Disaster Management Authority when this authority was constituted in 2005 after the tsunami uh, from the United Nations. So I resigned from the United Nations to join the Government of India to participate in this, uh, in this mission of transforming from a post-disaster relief to pre-disaster preparedness and mitigation. So as we go along, I'll actually narrate some of these things as to how it has been happening in this country. I'm delighted to be here also because what uh, Mr. Samir Kochar and uh, his team has actually tried to put together is to show India at work and to show the third generation reforms. We need to understand also the fact that disaster management is an extremely important area. And in the joint communication, the joint communique which is signed by President Bush and Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh in, uh, in US, uh, two major issues which India and United States wanted to work together by disaster management and terrorism to, to basically address the issues in disaster management and also to address issues of man-made disasters, especially terrorism. <clears throat> now, when you really want to look at this whole field of disaster management, because the disaster management is also a field which is multidisciplinary, I'm reminded of this quote from Will Durant from Story of Philosophy. He said, in 1926, he said this, and it is so pertinent today with the internet and various other forms of communication and knowledge dissemination. He said in 1926 that human knowledge had become unmanageably vast. Every science had begotten a dozen more, each, subtly, each subtler than the rest. The telescope reveals stars and systems beyond the mind of man to number or to name. Geology spoke in terms of millions of years, where men before had thought in terms of thousands. Physics found a universe in the atom, and biology found, found a microcosm in the cell. Physiology discovered the inexhaustible mystery in every organ and psychology in every dream. Anthropology reconstructed the unsuspected antiquity of man. Archaeology unearthed buried cities and forgotten states. History proved all history false, 
and painted a canvas which only a Spengler or an Edward Mayer could vision as a whole. Theology crumbled and political theory cracked. Invention complicated life and war, and economic creeds overturned governments and inflamed the world. Philosophy itself, which had once summoned all sciences to its aid in making a coherent image of the world and an alluring picture of the good, found the task of coordination too stupendous for its courage, ran away from all these battlefields of truth, and hid itself in recondite and narrow lanes, timidly secure from the issues and responsibilities of life. Human knowledge had become too great for the human mind. All that remained was a scientific specialist who knew more and more about less and less, and the philosophical speculator who knew less and less about more and more. And now we need to have a, a balance. You cannot only be a, a scientific specialist who knows more and more about less and less of a subject, or a philosophical speculator who knows less and less about more and more subjects, you have to find a fine balance between the kind of multidisciplinary knowledge explosion that is happening. And disaster management, in some ways, epitomizes that whole need to converge disciplines. And I'm sure that all of you from different backgrounds, because I see my friend, Dr. Ambani, my colleague, who is a nuclear scientist. And in the National Disaster Management Authority, we have people from different specializations, from medical sciences, from nuclear sciences, from you know, the field of uh, our, our strategy in preparedness and mitigation. And we also look at knowledge management as one of the most important areas in this convergence. The global impact of disasters. Each year, natural disasters result, result in thousands of deaths, injuries, and loss of property and infrastructure, as well as substantial economic losses. In 2004 and 2005, the economic losses due to natural disasters touched $350 billion. And according to the World Bank, 97% of the disaster-related deaths occur in developing countries. In the past two decades alone, direct reported economic losses from natural disasters have multiplied five-fold in real terms to $629 billion. And if you really look at the last four decades, the real annual economic losses, annual economic losses have averaged $75.5 billion in the 60s, $138.4 billion in the 70s, $213.9 billion in the 1980s, and $659.9 billion in the 1990s. You can see that it is actually becoming a colossal drain on the consolidation of all the accumulated infrastructure, critical infrastructure and public assets and amenities which we are creating. Suddenly, you know, it can all get wiped out, as we saw in Gujarat, in the Gujarat earthquake. An earthquake lasting a few seconds could really wipe out the entire public assets and infrastructure and amenities and schools and hospitals and, and private buildings and residential complexes and government buildings and so on. So it's very important for us to really understand this whole aspect of preparedness and mitigation. According to the bank, World Bank, an annual costs of damage due to disasters vary from 2 to 15 percent of the GDP of the affected countries. 2 to 15 percent of the GDP. And in India, we have found that every year, we are actually spending almost 2% of the GDP in terms of post-disaster relief. And that's a huge drain when you really look at the colossal magnitude in terms of resources. And as we have actually seen in some of the recent disasters, it's actually working out to several thousands of crores when we are actually looking at the quantum of money which we're using as post-disaster relief. The U.S. Geological Survey and the World Bank estimated that an investment of $40 billion in the 90s would have prevented losses of $280 billion, so, which means that every dollar which is invested in preparedness and mitigation can actually save about $7 on an average. And in India, during 2005 to 2010, during the 12th Finance Commission, the funds recommended to be set aside for post-disaster relief is to the tune of 21,333 crores. 21,333 crores. You can imagine if, if you have a resilient economy, a resilient society, what could be the alternate uses to which these resources could be put to best use. It could be for education for the children. It could be for hospital facilities for the people who really require hospital support, medical support, and so on. So this is actually becoming an important area. Now, if you look at the, the developed countries and the developing countries, 11% of the people are exposed in an average per year in the, in the poor countries or in the developing countries, and 53% of them get killed per year. Whereas in the advanced countries, 15% get exposed in an average per year, 
but 1.8 percent get killed. Now, this is an extremely interesting, uh, you know, point for us to observe that in the advanced countries, the reason why the disasters, in spite of the fact that it's actually exposing a larger number of people uh, as a percentage of the population, the lesser number of people are getting killed or lesser damage to properties are taking place because they have been investing in preparedness and mitigation. Their buildings are actually constructed looking at the earthquake-resistant building codes and the building bylaws and the town planning bylaws and other things. So it's important that technological regime is extremely important, compliance is extremely important. Now, if you look at hist historiography of disasters in India, you know, India was known for the famines during the British period. If you look at all this during the 1770s and uh, later, there have been several famines, and the, the most important and the most devastating was the Great Bengal Famine of 1769 to 1770, in which there have been chronicles written on that, memoirs by British uh, administrators during that period, which mentions that a third of the population in India perished in that great famine, one third of the population. And if you really recall some of the writings of those great Bengal famine, they say that uh, the scarcity of food grains and the scarcity of uh, food had even compelled many people to even become carnivores. You know, people had to survive eating human flesh. And if that is the kind of things which we had gone through, you know, 300 years ago, and we have made a transition now from that famines, you suddenly see the transition in the post-independence period to the drought years. Now, the famines have actually now shifted to drought because you're also getting self-sufficiency in the production of food grains and so on. So now we are actually having the scarcity of water, but it's not leading to famines and it's not leading to loss of lives of people. And, of course, the recurring floods used to happen. Now, if you really look at uh, all the... Uh, the relative vulnerability to various types of disasters in India, you will see that actually um, you can see that India is uh, in many of these things, whether it is tropical cyclones, in terms of the number of people who are actually affected, uh, the average annual deaths or the average population exposed, you can see that in, in terms of earthquakes and floods and cyclones, India is actually having a larger number of people who are getting exposed as well as earthquakes and floods. So this is also important for us to understand this. And the complexity in the management of disasters is the fact that there are several agencies which are responsible for looking at different types of disasters. For instance, drought is looked after by the Ministry of Agriculture, floods by the Ministry of Water Resources and the Central Water Commission, cyclones by the Indian Meteorological Department, earthquakes by IMD, epidemics by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, avian flu again by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Husbandry, chemical disasters by MOEF, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, industrial disasters by Ministry of Labor, rail accidents by Ministry of Railways, air accidents by Ministry of Aviation, and so on, uh, fire by Home Affairs, nuclear incidents by the Department of Atomic Energy, and mine disasters by the Department of Mines. So there is a complexity in terms of even the management of disasters by different multifarious institutions which are responsible for each of them. Now, if you really look at the last two decades, uh, you know, we find that uh, some of the major disasters which have happened in India, and even during the period of the IED and DR, the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, which was from 1990 to 2000, we actually had some of the most devastating disasters in our country. We had the 1993, the Maharashtra earthquake, the Lathur earthquake in Maharashtra. In 1995, you know, we also had the earthquakes. Uh, we had the Jabalpur, Uttarkashi earthquake, and Chamoli earthquake. And uh, we also had the uh, the Bhopal gas tragedy in December 1984, in Super Cyclone in Orissa in 1999, and uh, the recent one was the tsunami in 2004, the Indian Ocean tsunami, which actually led to the setting up of institutional mechanisms like the National Disaster Management Authority as the apex body in the country, state disaster management authorities headed by state chief ministers in every state, and district disaster management authorities headed by the district collectors. <clears throat> now, I would like to just quickly run through some of these, what actually many of these disasters have actually shown. This is a tsunami, Nagapatnam, Kadalur. Now, many of these things have actually shown that loss of life and loss of property had actually created devastation. Now, we come to the Bombay floods. Uh, you saw the, briefly the picture. But if you really look at the national highways, the state expressways in Mumbai, which got inundated because of the sudden 
downpour, which happened 900 millimeters in 24 hours on the 25th of July 2005, and on the 26th, this was the situation on the ground. You can see that the taxi is trying to cross the road, and there are thousands of vehicles which are waiting to see what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, you see that uh, an auto rickshaw has already gone down, and the water level was rising because it was also a high tide, and the water level was rising, and there were people in the cars. And there were people who were actually taking back school children, taking back the children back from school, people going back from office, and suddenly you see the water level rising around you, and after some time you find that people have been in the, in the roads for about 30 hours, 38 hours, waiting for the water to come down, and many people actually put on the air conditioner in the car, and after some time, because you, know, you, can't, you can't bring down the glasses, you, know, you can't open the doors, you're actually inside, and the backdraft is actually putting in carbon monoxide into the car, and people suffocate and die in the cars. Now, this was one of the problems which happened in Mumbai. You can see that you can imagine a situation in this when there are people inside these cars. Now, these actually challenge the questions in terms of what is it that, as the administrators in the Mumbai Municipal Corporation or administrators uh, you know, handling the district administration or the relief commissioners of the state, many of you uh, have actually, you know, will be listening to presentations uh, after 4 o'clock on the presentations from the states. Now, the way in which cities are growing in our country, and if you really see also what happened, one of the biggest challenges which we faced very recently, just a few, few weeks ago, was the Kosi floods. And how did the Kosi floods really become a tragedy, which was beyond the logistics uh, possibilities in terms of addressing that? And I would like to just mention that the Kosi floods this year affected about 43 lakhs of people. But in the previous years, actually 1987, we had a situation when 2.86 crores of people were affected by floods in Bihar. And in 2004, 2.2 .2 crores of people were affected by floods in Bihar. And why is it that these 43 lakhs became a problem which could not be managed by the local administration, by the National Disaster Response Force, and by the armed forces, by the Indian Navy, and by the Indian Army, and the Indian Air Force? I would li like to show you some, some brief clips of that. Actually, what happened was that the barrage, the Kosi barrage in Kosaha in Nepal, which is actually in the Nepal territory, uh, gave way. And it was initially giving way on the 18th of this month, 18th of September. Actually, it started giving way uh, by, uh, by having 200 meter breach. And then this breach started growing. And it is uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the reason for the breach was because of rodents actually creating this kind of a, a damage onto the mud embankments. But anyway, whatever was the, the real issue, from 200 meters, it grew to 1.8 kilometers. The breach became 1.8 kilometers, and through that, the water was gushing out in an 18-kilometer wide stretch. And that suddenly you know, brought uh, districts like Madhepura, Supal, Araria, and Katihar, and very, very many uh, districts, suddenly Saharsa, uh, all suddenly uh, you know, unsuspecting villages suddenly into this, uh, into this uh, affecting this. And if you really see how the, uh, uh, the Kosi River has changed, Prior to this, you can actually see that we have this Kosi River, which was actually growing in 1776. It was actually happening there. And it, this uh, river started moving. And now the, this is the course of the river before the breach. And suddenly, the breach happened here. And this is when we actually had the maximum damage. And then uh, more than 10 lakh people were evacuated in, this, uh, uh, in the Kosi floods. About a lakh of people were actually uh, evacuated uh, with uh, the National Disaster Response Force people. Now, in terms of the disaster vulnerability, you are aware of the kind of extent of disaster vulnerability in terms of all this. But the most important is the last bullet, which says there is a high probability of a low probability event happening sometime, somewhere, soon. And this, I think, is the biggest challenge. A low probability event, which could be a natural disaster, or it could be a man-made disaster, it could be a chemical disaster, or an earthquake, or a landslide, or a flood, which could happen anytime, anywhere. And that is where we need to really look at our own systems of preparedness and our own systems of mitigation. Now, in terms of the earthquakes, 229 districts in the country are vulnerable to uh, high-intensity earthquakes. They are in Zone 4 and Zone 5. 
229 districts in the country. So that, that shows that you know, we have a very high probability of earthquakes and also the past trends indicate that there have been very high seismic activity in the country, especially along the Himalayas. And uh, in terms of the high intensity of this, earthquakes and uh, floods and also the vulnerability to landslides and cyclones and the super cyclone. And uh, in 2004, we also saw the tsunami. For the first time, we saw that actually an earthquake which happened in Sumatra could trigger a tsunami which could actually affect the lives of several people in the coastal communities of our country. And the National Disaster Management Authority would uh, basically be assisted by the state disaster management authorities at the state level and also by the district disaster management authorities at the districts. So we have now a Disaster Management Act 2005 and uh, the institutional mechanisms, apart from that, a National Disaster Response Force with eight battalions, uh, which is located in different parts of our country. And we have also a National Institute of Disaster Management for training as the apex body for training in this country, along with the 29 Center for Disaster Management in 29 states, a National Executive Committee and state executive committees of the state disaster management authorities. And in, in terms of financial allocations, we also have proposed the Disaster Response Fund and the Disaster Mitigation Fund at national, state, and district levels. And in the 13th Finance Commission, headed by Dr. Vijay Kelkar, it, this is actually being examined because the, currently the 12th Finance Commission Award is valid till 2010. And so the new funds will actually start getting operationalized only after 2010. So we have basically looked at uh, some of these aspects. Now, uh, in terms of the new possibilities, we have schemes like the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, which has a tremendous prospect. We have 100,000 rural knowledge centers by the Ministry of Information Technology and uh, the IT chaos, which would actually provide for spatial e-governance for informed decision-making in disaster-prone areas before, during, and after disasters. And we are also taking up new mitigation projects to address disaster risk related to earthquakes, cyclones, floods, and landslides, etc. And in terms of various activities which we're doing in terms of multi-stakeholder participation, we are looking at uh, working with different agencies. But one of the most important things which I would like to mention is that so far, in terms of the paradigm shift, so far in this disaster cycle, we have not been looking at preparedness and prevention or mitigation. The upper half, which is a pre-disaster phase. We have always been reactive in the post-disaster phase because we have always been responding by setting up temporary relief camps by evacuating people and after the disaster. And we have been looking at rehabilitation by reconstruction of houses, reconstruction of hospitals, damaged schools, and so on. And then finally, recovery. And one of the most unfortunate things which have been happening is that by the time you're going through this process of rehabilitation and recovery, you are getting hit by yet another disaster. You know, you are not able to recover, actually. You know, so by the time the people, like in Assam or in, in Bihar or in Orissa or in West Bengal or in Uttar Pradesh, by the time they are able to recover from the floods, you know, suddenly the next monsoon season has started and the next floods have started. And so that is one of the biggest challenges. So we need to really concentrate on the preparedness part and the prevention or mitigation in the pre-disaster phase. And that is one of the things which we are meaning by the paradigm shift in disasters. That is, we are not going to be looking only at post-disaster solutions, but we'll be looking at pre-disaster preparedness and mitigation. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have uh, Dr. Raman Rao uh, from the EMRI, from the Satim Group, the Emergency Management Research Institute, which uh, will actually be giving you a very detailed presentation on the kind of uh, participation which they have done with 11 states and how their scheme is actually working in terms of providing an integrated ambulance network. One of the most gratifying things for us has been the fact that when we've had serial blasts happening in different parts of our country, we've seen the 108 ambulances. You know, you must have also seen on the television sets that uh, the first response actually has been provided by the 108. And he will talk more of that, so I would not be spending time on that. But in terms of working in preparedness, we need to work at the emergency operation centers, like the one you saw in Mumbai in the film. You know, the emergency operation centers which can take in messages and then respond immediately. Helicopter ambulances, mobile field hospitals, containerized mobile field hospitals. In a state like Uttarakhand, uh, we have only 1,600 hospital beds. So you can imagine if a high-intensity earthquake can happen in, uh, in Uttarakhand, in the Himalayas, and uh, going by the Gujarat experience, more than 10,000 people dead, more than 1.5 lakh people injured, and if you recall the immediate post-disaster hours, 
both in the super cyclone in Orissa, when the Kalinga Stadium had become an open-air hospital, an open-air operation theater, the same way the Gujarat, the Bhuj Stadium, was converted into an open-air theater, operation theater, where people were actually being wheeled in with hand carts. You know, all the hand carts were bringing in people who were injured with orthopedic injuries, and then people were actually having to operate. The doctors who performed you know, uh, probably one of the most uh, surprising number of uh, surgeries in a day in terms of looking at life-saving uh, surgeries which were done by hosp doctors in, the, in, in conditions where it is not properly sanitized, you do not have that kind of facilities. But if you need to really look at that, we need to look at containerized mobile field hospitals. And so we have actually proposed that there will be a, a medical preparedness and mass casualty management strategy in our country. And you must have seen many of the trauma centers which are coming up in different parts of our country. So there are trauma centers proposed by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and emergency helicopter ambulances and containerized mobile, mobile field hospitals. An integrated ambulance network, we will talk about uh, EMRI, we'll actually have this detailed presentation. Interagency coordination, and then application of GIS, geographic information systems, simulations and scenarios and models. Early warning systems, the tsunami early warning system, Dr. Silish Naik from the Ministry of Earth Sciences will talk about that in terms of the tsunami early warning system there. And uh, mobilizing communities, community-based disaster preparedness. One of, as I mentioned earlier, the disaster risk management project. Now we are actually center staging communities by involving other stakeholders like the NGOs and the corporate sector and others. Fire and emergency services, police and health officials, community responders. Now, I'm sure that many of you know that the average, the mean median age for an Indian is 23.8 years. India is a very young country in, the, in terms of the population's median age. But the youth have to get involved in disaster preparedness and disaster mitigation. And if you really look at the numbers of people in between the age group of uh, 13 to 45, we have uh, more than 400 million people. Now, in, in terms of the numbers of people, there are several million, several hundred millions of people who are available to us in colleges and universities and schools, and we need to involve them with this, especially with civil defense, the Home Guards, the Indian Red Cross, the NSS, the NCC, the Nehru Yuva Kendra, Scouts and Guides, etc. And, and of course, we have the armed forces, the Army, the Navy, Air Force, and the Coast Guards who have provided extremely impeccable services during all the major disasters. I've had the privilege of having to work very closely with, uh, uh, with uh, many of the armed forces officers, uh, both uh, in land, air, and sea, and I've seen the kind of uh, you know, commitment and the dedication which happened, which they used to contribute. And in fact, uh, in the Indian Ocean tsunami, out of the 13 countries affected, India's response, not only within the country, but also in the region, was really laudable because our medical teams, the naval medical ships, were actually available in Banda Aceh, in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, and in Maldives. Now, the subject is very vast, and so you know, I've actually uh, you know, had a, a very major difficult uh, time in terms of trying to ca you know, bring it all together into a very brief presentation. So I think what is most important is to take back this message that from a hitherto reactive post-disaster relief-centric regime, we are actually shifting to a more proactive approach of strengthening disaster preparedness, mitigation measures, and emergency response. And it is accompanied by the national resolve and a national vision for working towards a disaster resilient India by involving all stakeholders in creating a culture of preparedness, mitigation, and a coordinated, prompt, and effective emergency response. Now, if I can take another five more minutes, I would like to uh, quickly uh, take you through some of the most important issues because I think uh, this is a very vast field and then you know in the last three years actually we've worked with some of the, the most outstanding professionals in our country and it has been a pleasure working with professionals from different walks of life but the most important part of it I think is the fact that we need to understand that in this whole process we have to make it into a people's process. Now that environment, the same way in which environment has become a concern the same way in which climate change adaptation is becoming a concern for people all over the world. And it, this is a global issue. But at the same time, in terms of our country, because of its vast size and scale and the complexity and the disaster risk and vulnerability profile, we need to involve each and every one of our country. And that's a huge, huge task. We used to make these back-of-the-envelope calculations and then think that if you assume that there are six lakh villages in our country and if you want to identify 10 people in every, every village, 
who is disaster aware, who knows how to evacuate people, who knows how to set up a relief camp, who knows how to distribute relief in a, in a gender sensitive, in an egalitarian manner, with respect to elderly, with respect to the compassion, with respect to you know, the cultural and uh, various other subtleties and nuances, you, know, you will need 60 lakhs of people to be trained, to be made aware, six million people in a year. And if you want to reach this whole country of a billion people, it will take us 180 years. And we do not have the luxury of that time. And I think what is needed is to really scale up this whole process of creating awareness through public awareness facilities, through involving the communities in every institution, and to take this as a collective national purpose that you know, we need to minimize the impact of disasters and we need to invest more in terms of our preparedness and mitigation. And as I said, this is a mega discipline and we have professionals from all kinds of fields helping in this whole process. And I'm very proud to say that uh, the India's uh, tsunami early warning system, of which you'll hear more about it during the day, uh, is one of the, the most outstanding ex examples of the commitment, the dedication of our scientific community, the professionals uh, among us, to have contributed and to provide that kind of inspiration. And finally, in terms of the future directions, I think you know, we will need to bring this multi-stakeholder initiative, but I will conclude by just mentioning this, it is possible. And one of the best illustrations, one of the sterling examples of how this is made possible is from Bangladesh. For those of you who are familiar with the Cox Bazar initiative, in Bangladesh, in Cox Bazar, on the 12th of November 1970, a major cyclone disturbed the Cox Bazar area, and it came at 223 kilometers per hour and killed 500,000 people, five lakh people, the largest number of people ever killed in one of the disasters in the subcontinent, 500,000 people in 1970. And because of the cyclone preparedness program started by the civil society organizations, by the Red Cross and other agencies, in 1991, when the cyclone with the same intensity, it killed 138,000 people, even when population in Cox Bazar had doubled. But in 1994, a similar cyclone with a wind speed of 250 kilometers per hour killed only 127 people. And in May 1997, in a cyclone with a wind speed of 200 kilometers per hour, only 111 people lost their lives. So I think this shows that it is possible, we can do it, and if we all have to put it together. And at the National Disaster Management Authority, we would like to welcome any suggestions, any recommendations from all of you, from institutions, individuals who would like to contribute to this national endeavor, we'll be very happy to, to be of assistance and to, to take you along with us in this whole, uh, in, in, into, uh, into this whole exercise. And I think uh, I must underline this and mention this in my concluding remark that uh, disaster management is not a 10 to 5 job. It is a 24-hour commitment. And we need to do this with passion. Thank you very much.